Good afternoon. I want to thank you for joining us uh, and welcome to the Convert Summit. I am Leslie Hall and I'm the director of the HBCU program here at the Human Rights Campaign. Through our programming with Gilead Sciences, our community partners will play a vital role in us helping move the needle towards ending the HIV epidemic. During the session titled Higher Ground, Navigating HIV and STIs at HBCUs, we will discuss the vital role HBCUs play in fighting to eradicate HIV and dismantle HIV-related stigma in the HBCU community. Today, I am so excited to have assembled a dynamic panel of uh, higher ed leaders with us uh, who are on the front lines of supporting our students and creating an inclusive campus environment. First, we have Mr. Michael Sharp. He is the Interim Director of Housing and Residence Life at Savannah State University. And we have Dr. Linwood Witten, uh, the Interim Assistant Vice President of Student Affairs at Alabama State University. We will learn a little bit more about them with the first question that I have, but I would first like to just thank you all for joining me today. Uh, I am amongst friends and I'm so excited for the conversation. So without further ado, let's get to the first question. Uh, with over a decade of experience in student affairs and HBCUs for the both of you, uh, why is it important for HBCUs to prioritize and invest in HIV and AIDS related programming? Uh, and I'll let, uh, let's go uh, by um, the first, the, the alphabetical order of your last name. So I'll go with Michael first. <laughs> Good afternoon, <laughs> Leslie and Dr. Witten. Thank you for the opportunity to serve on this panel. Um, according to the Center for Disease and Control, the ages that HBCUs typically serve, which is um, 18 through 24 years of age, that is the highest um, in new diagnosis of HIV AIDS that um, we serve those that population. So it's very important that HBCUs get ahead of this and um, prioritize and invest in HIV AIDS programs so that we are hitting that target age period for those students. And we'll go with so Dr. Just, Witten next. All right, so just to echo what, um, what Michael said, and once again, thank you so much for allowing me to join this panel. Uh, it was good of to course. see you all. My brother's in the in the good fight for you know, social <laughs> justice and equality. <laughs> so when you think about um, the the purpose of historical black college and university is to serve a certain demographic of students. And when you look at the statistics from the, the CDC, you will see that you know the newest cases of HIV uh, come from the African American community. And sometimes that comes from uh, a lack of resources and a lack of education. And so we believe at HBCUs that education starts uh, on our campus, especially within the um, Division of Student Affairs and Enrollment Management, uh, making sure that our students are aware of the different types of health disparities, as well as STIs and other things outside of uh, HIV that uh, basically, you know, students will need to be knowledgeable of. Uh, most of the students at uh, HBCUs uh, know about gonorrhea, they know about syphilis and herpes and things of that nature but they don't really know the difference between AIDS and HIV. And it's quite prevalent, um, not just on college campuses in general, but we wanna make sure that we're looking out for the demographic of students that we um, educate every day. Uh, especially when you look at the number of cases in African-American uh, females. Uh, and thinking about that, and you, if you know anything about higher ed, you also know that there are more female uh, students than male students. So it's important to also educate that population as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was spot on. Um, it hasn't been that long ago since I was an undergrad. And I know when I was an undergrad, uh, you know, going to get tested on campus was not something that um, was a very popular thing to do, particularly uh, if you were going to go to the health center. Um, so, you know, with both of you working um, at two uh, universities uh, in the South, um, I'd love to know uh, how your campus uh, promotes, um, in what ways does your campus promote confidential HIV testing? And that's for whoever wants to answer first. Dr. Witten, being that I went first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for, for yielding. Uh, so <laughs> at the campus of Alabama State University, we are very mindful about our student engagement uh, and how we 
uh, educate them and roll things out. So we created an initiative in my office and I'm in the office of uh, diversity and international affairs. And I also advise the uh, GSA, which is amplified on our campus. And so we came together to think about how to remove stigma from being from getting tested. And so we partnered with an organization here in Montgomery, Alabama called Medical Advocacy Outreach, MAO. And Karen is our, um, our representative on, with that particular initiative. And what we did was we created an opportunity for students to have anonymous testing. And so we hand we have these handouts, the little sheets of paper that you can rip off the, at the bottom, and it gives you information to contact the, the rep for or the counselor for MAO. And what I did was partner with our Office of Facilities Management to where even I don't even know where the anonymous testing site is on campus. Uh, the student was able to uh, send a text message and receive a message back to let them know what day they'll be on campus and what location to meet them in. And they'll have one-on-one -on -one counseling and testing uh, all in one day. Uh, this removes stigma and we've had an increase in a number of students who have gotten tested and who have given feedback and saying that they were happy that we provided this type of uh, programming. Uh, this also was able to uh, expand our partnerships with local uh, communities as well and, and different programs and nonprofits in Montgomery. Hold on, Michael, before you, before, cause I wanna, I, so, so your campus is able to allow for students to go get tested anonymously and nobody knows where this is gonna be, like the staff so, and- So, right, exactly. It's so a novel I thing. Was, I think I want folks to see this, to, to that that will listen to this broadcast. So yes, really what, I, what, I, what I did was I, I contacted the um, director of facilities management I told him what the what the idea was, and I said I need you to get in touch with with Karen over at MAO, and I walked around and we actually was like, okay, well these types of rooms will uh, be sufficient for what she needs, and so it's like, okay, well the rooms will change, uh, but this is the areas that we can give to facilitate the testing, and so the students basically once they uh, contact the counselor, the counselor and our facilities management person are the only two people that know where they are. So I don't even know, I'm out of the equation as well. I don't know who's getting tested or where the testing takes place. All that I know is that on our campus, I think it's Tuesdays and Thursdays, the testing is happening between a set of hours. So, yeah. So it, it definitely removes the stigma and it encourages students to get tested. And the, one of the key things about where we uh, place this information are in the bathroom stalls of the male and the female um, restrooms as well as in the residence hall. So we put the information where students can get it and they don't have the fear of someone seeing them uh, getting the uh, the information to be tested. Yeah, thank you for that. Michael. Mm -hmm. Well, at Savannah State, um, we actually partner with our Counseling Services Center. Um, there are about three or four of us that are able to do confidential testing. So students are able to set up an appointment and designate where they want to go get testing at. Um, I am one of the testers that I can test them confidentially in my office. My office is in the back of a building. Um, <laughs> um, doors are closed, so no one knows why they're in here. They can either be in here getting tested or they can be in here talking to me about housing information. So they're able to come and get tested, um, receive their information, and then I'm able to partner them with any services that they may need. Also, we partner with our Chatham County Health Department that comes out and do confidential testing on our campus. As a matter of fact, last Friday, we actually had a testing date where they come in, they register, they'll go to an area, get tested, their, their curtains are sectioned off, and there's a Chatham County Health Professional that administers that test. Um, also, our students are able to go confidentially to get tested in our health center. Um, we, we partner with Curtis B. Cooper that does HIV and STI testing um, on certain days of the week. So they're able to go there to get tested as well. Again, no one knows why a student could be going to the health center. Um, just the, the week I was just walking in to get my blood pressure checked. So students don't know why people are going to the infirmary or health center, so to speak, to, to get tested or anything of that nature. So, yeah, that's such a novel approach. When I was, again, when I, and it wasn't that long ago I was an undergrad. Okay. So like, you know, when I was, when I was roaming the campus, you know, uh, <laughs> we stayed away from the health center. And I think most of, most, mostly because uh, it had very little to, to do with my sexuality and more to do with, we had a nursing program on campus and all the students 
that were in a nursing program worked in the health center. And it's just like, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want to go there, you know? And, and it's just, so this is good. I'm glad to hear that our campuses it, are, are really meeting students where they are uh, it, and, <laughs> and allowing them to do that. Yeah. Exactly. Like, um, I do like that students are able to come to my office. So to speak. You see, I have my condoms back there, so they're yeah. able to come get condoms. Oh, you, you, you only, so that was the second, that was going to be the second <laughs> question that I had for both of y'all. Well, not second, the third kind of like spinoff of, the, of what I just asked. And that was, how do you all give out condoms on campus? Because again, yeah. back in the day, you know, you literally, there was only one place you could go to get condoms, and that was the health center. And you know, the way that our lives work, it wasn't like, you know, a lot of this stuff wasn't planned. So, <laughs> you know, like, so how do you, so, so I want to, I want to know, like, how do you, what are some best practices that, that you all are doing on your campuses to make sure that students have these um, types of tools at their disposal? Well, can I go, Michael? You can go. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so one of the things that uh, we do, it was very important for um, our student affairs offices to be involved in this process. So all the units within Student Affairs has a space in their office up front where they have different contraceptives. Uh, we partner with Medical Advocacy Outreach, Thrive Alabama and Game Changer out of Birmingham. And they come on our campus, they do testing and they also leave us with supplies. And so we have dental dam, we have lube, we have condoms, we even have magnums because students love their magnums. Because I think it's more a brand recognition, not understanding yeah, that it's yeah, about yeah. size, but more like <laughs> brand. So we also have a pamphlet that says how to use a condom. Our um, health center also does uh, health training, like sexual sexual health training. Uh, and then Amplify, we always do uh, condom bars. So you know how you go to uh, people's uh, bridal showers or baby showers and they have like the dessert bar? With mm -hmm. the, you know the big goblets and everything wow. like that. Yeah. we do that with the condoms and, and you know you know so we have oral wow. sex condoms we even have insertive condoms so um you know so male or female can use those insertive condoms wow. uh, as well so we try to be inclusive we try to be inclusive to uh, making sure that students um, have good sexual health and uh, protect themselves and others and just the other day I was in my office and a student went into the jar and pulled out a condom and was like, hey, you need some of these to another student. And the student goes, I'm not having sex. And I turned around and said, well, you might know someone who is having sex. So it's always good to have uh, condoms on hand to be able to um, you know, distribute to those who need them. Yeah, so wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> so as Savannah said, of course, I have my condom dispenser right behind me. When students are coming in, um, they can get condoms. Um, the condom dispensers are also throughout the campus, various people have them in their office, especially student affairs team. Some people do condoms and candy, so they mix the condoms and candy in a jar so you don't know what they're reaching for. Um, <laughs> just before we dismiss or we let our students go for the fall semester, shortly after Halloween, University Housing came up with the idea of condoms and candy. So we, after Halloween, when, when candy was cheap, went out and purchased a candy and put condoms and candy in a bag with sexual um, sexual statistics and things of that nature, how to use a condom, and then just the information packet on where to go for testing, the information for the infirmary, even counseling services, even the students were able to contact counselors while they're away for the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. And then we just had those placed throughout the residence halls and students were able to come by and pick up a bag of candy uh, and some of them had healthy treats in there, granola bars and things of that nature. So they were able to pick up a healthy treat or a snack bag that was filled with condoms. And some of the condoms, some of the bags, excuse me, did have female condoms in them as well. Yeah, I want to... Uh, condoms. You have to be inclusive. Yeah, that's, insertive that's, condoms. That's, insertive that's, condoms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Alabama State is paving the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I do want to just also, you know, share that that the work that y'all are doing as it relates to these condoms um, is, is really a testament to, to how you are perceived on campus. I know that um, a lot of staff members uh, may feel uncomfortable uh, to, 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 you know, be that, you know, I guess, open uh, with students, um, but, you know, it's reciprocal. Students have to feel comfortable with coming to you 
Right. Um, and, and it sounds as if, uh, and I just know, because I know the both of you and I know how you all are, are, are viewed on campus, that that is a positive thing. And so um, for those that are in student affairs, it's like uh, developing positive, healthy relationship with your students could really save their life because these are things mm -hmm. that, you know, students kind of suffer in silence with because they don't feel that um, there's anyone on campus to talk to them. And so um, I wanted to highlight that point as well, because I got along with a lot of folks on campus, but I don't know if I, if I, you know, was open enough to, to be, you know, talk, uh, talk, sex, healthy sex, um, with any questions that I may have had uh, with, with anyone on campus. So I wanna thank you for that. Um, one last point on that, actually. Um, uh, both of you uh, advise uh, SGA and student groups in a variety of capacities. Um, are there any ways that you can share that, that student leaders have a role to play um, in this conversation around uh, you know, promoting healthy sex with uh, contraceptives or whatever on campus? And if so, can you just kind of share with us your, your yeah. take on that? Oh, definitely. Just like, you know, you have influencers in social media, your student leaders are your influencers on campus. So utilize them. Uh, yeah. Sex is not something to be looked down upon. It should be an experience that people should enjoy. And also part of that responsibility in, in having sex is being safe. Uh, protecting yourself and also protecting your partner or partners. Uh, so, you know, when we ever have programming with our uh, student leaders, we always talk about sexual health, especially when it comes to um, African American HIV Day or uh, World AIDS Day, or whenever we have, like, we have an upcoming uh, women's uh, forum. And of course, we'll talk about the different types of health, you know, mental health and sexual health and spiritual health. And so it'll, it'll always come up in conversation. Uh, and then we have opportunities, for, again, for our uh, health center, our counseling center, to to do some um, some counseling and some um, advice when it comes to these things. And one of the things that we've been progressive enough to talk about is PrEP, because a lot of our students don't know what PrEP is. But then we have a student who is also part of uh, Greek life. And this individual is, uh, he's a, he used to be the uh, president of Amplified, but he was willing to have an open conversation about PrEP and its benefits and why he chose to use PrEP. So I thought that was very good. So that's another way we use our student leaders because a lot of times students don't want to hear from the administrator. They want to hear from their peers, right? And so they'll listen to each other. You just have to make sure that you train and educate those who will be uh, utilizing those platforms to, to be equipped with the right information, the tools, and the resources. So. Yeah, I'm, just to pick you off what Linwood, Dr. Whitten <laughs> um, stated, your student leaders can be your gatekeepers of the information. Um, right. Mr. Junior works in my office, so I utilize him to communicate information out. Uh, work very closely with our student life, with SGA, and eboard, and things of and things of that nature. So utilizing them when we have events that are relating to sexual health. Uh, programs that are related to using them to pass the information on because like Linwood said sometimes students don't want to hear from administrators they want to hear from their peers or if you're active in the community in your campus community they will come up to you and say well hey sharp i heard that they're going to do be doing hiv testing where's it going to be at oh i i saw the email but i just passed it by but so can you give me a little bit more information so again utilizing those student leaders and being active in your on your campus all right. So you hear that HBCUs use your student leaders to get the word out. You don't have to do all the work yourself. Uh, and, and, you know, just to think back when I was on campus is, you know, like students know where to go to to get to the, you know, to get to other students. Um, and so there are a lot of underground stuff that's happening, too, that that we need to um, be aware of. I want to shift gears a little bit. Uh, Dr. Winton already kind of touched on it. So I'm going to let Michael answer this one first as it relates to formal uh, partnerships with the community-based organizations. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, uh, you know, one of the gospels that I preach to a lot of HBCUs when I'm visiting their campuses is that uh, if you don't have to try to boil the ocean, right? Like there are a lot of issues out there and you don't have to try to do everything on your own, right? And so there are community-based organizations really in every community where there's an HBCU, and I, I, I'm guessing, uh, that receive 
money from CDC, local, state, national partners uh, to do HIV testing, to prescribe and, and you know, prep and to, to conduct the lab work that is uh, associated with um, prep. Uh, so the, the, my question is, um, does your campus have any formal uh, uh, partnerships with any of these community-based organizations? If so, can you share with us like what, what that partnership is? Um, and can you tell us a little bit about how you were able to develop that partnership? I know there are a lot of folks uh, from HBCUs right now looking to say, you know what? We could you we could utilize a partnership with a local community based organization, but how do we how do we go about that? And so, if you all can just talk a little bit about that um, and that process for you, and what and what you utilize uh, that CBO for. So we do partner with a community based organization, Curtis D. Cooper, which is a federal funded um, health um, nonprofit health center, and they come on our campus and host a men's clinic and a women's clinic in our health department. So students are able to go on, again, I touched on it earlier, are able to go over and get tested for HIV and STI um, testing. And those do happen on separate days. So the, the males are not going in at the same time that the that women, the females are going in. So we do partner with, with the Curtis V. Cooper Health Center. And that was set up utilizing our counseling services. Um, our director of counseling services, Ms. Jacqueline Alway, she works very closely with them as well as our nurse practitioner, Sunny Ogden. So she works very, they work very closely with the Curtis V. Cooper uh, Center to, that comes onto our campus and does the confidential HIV and STI testing. So, um, yeah, so once again, just to reiterate what I mentioned earlier, or segue into, <laughs> <laughs> um, Medical Advocacy Outreach has always wanted to partner with Alabama State University. So part of me coming on board was uh, basically trying to rekindle some of those relationships that may have been uh, severed in the past. And uh, we utilized the Game Changer, which was out of Birmingham, but MAO was actually in Montgomery. So it was like, well, why are we going to Birmingham to get services? Because they have a grant, and then we have a grant for this region as well not only through MAO, but also through the Montgomery um, Health Department. And what I learned, it was based upon who the students trusted. And for our department, we really did work closely with Amplify, which is our GSA on campus, because students know who they're going to trust to test them, right? Because they've been on, on campus since they were freshmen, and, you know, they're going to help bring the other students in, you know, to bring the crowd to get tested, right? And so... One of the things about our partnerships was that if you're going to provide a service, also provide us with some resources. So that's how we get a lot of the allocation of the dams, the insert of condoms, the, the lubes, the um, the regular sex condoms, the oral sex condoms, things of that nature. They always leave those same giveaways when they come onto our campus. I know the game changer used to come on our campus with their mobile van. And so they would park it in the middle of the quad, which is really close to the student center. So you would catch that traffic with students going to through the calf or coming to the student center or to our food court. Um, and because it was consistent, uh, they could always count on uh, having that service provided uh, to them. Uh, and then, you know, we have other giveaways and things of that nature. But again, those partnerships were developed out of relationships that we built with those particular um, community outreach directors. And they also have their own strategic plans and initiatives, and they have their regions that they, they have to uh, maintain and manage the caseloads in that area. And so that's some of the programs that they have are based upon those grants. So they really do wanna partner with your institutions because they're reaching that demographic of young people between the ages of 18 and, and 24. All right. All right. And they need the numbers, Michael. Right. And one thing I was going to say, one thing that the Chatham County Health Department did um, maybe two years ago or so pre-COVID, I would say, <laughs> was that I was working, able to work with a representative from there who who was developing a, a LGBT men's, so to speak, community. So they got together and they were able to offer students a free pass to go skating at one of the local skating rinks. So they were able to come in, get tested, and they had to be a student of one of the institutions here in Savannah. Savannah State was one of them. They were able to go get tested, skate for um, about an hour or two, uh, and they got giveaways during that time period as well. 
That's that's so that's so innovative. Um, and so that's actually a really good point. I wanna I wanna make sure everybody understands. Mm -hmm. So um, again, about meeting students where they are, right? And so what I was gonna ask before you um, you said that, Michael, was do you all uh, utilize any of the staple campus events like maybe homecoming or um, any type of other red letter day for the institution to utilize that as an opportunity to encourage students to say, hey, if you come over here to get tested, you can get a free ticket over here. Or I see that Savannah, you all are doing that uh, community wide. And so that's mm -hmm. that's good as well. If you um, I, and I know, you know, like Dillard University, for instance, Dr. Kimbrough was uh, instituted um, sex week um, mm -hmm. at, on, on his campus. And I know um, a few other schools do some things throughout the week as well. Do you all uh, on your campuses, do you all have like any special type, type of events or weeks where you really kind of speak to the topic of healthy sex or HIV, STI related stuff? We used to do that during homecoming and traditionally our homecoming in the past has been our Turkey Day Classic, uh, Labor Day Classic is another big time <laughs> that we have those uh, conversations. Uh, we also have those conversations during Magic City Classic. And then Amplified also has a week. And during that week, that's embedded into the uh, programming. And then, of course, because I'm out of the Office of Diversity and International Affairs, anytime there is a month highlighting um, any type of awareness to prevention, then we also take advantage of uh, having programming for that time. And there are always some types of initiatives or giveaways to engage our students, uh, whether it's a ticket, to see Megan the Stallion, a little of the baby, uh, whether it's uh, to to a game, whether we're giving away uh, T-shirts from from our institution or from some other programs that we've had. Uh, even sometimes I will go to Target and see uh, any type of uh, like, for example, uh, Amplified during Pride Month. I always go buy everything at those on sale, like my little pin here. Oh yeah, and is that everyone? Is that a everyone? This is, this is everyone HRC. Yes. yes thank you. And so like I'll buy like everything yeah, to give away, to give away <laughs> to give away to students. And then I also partner with our Alabama State Director for HRC, uh Carmarian Anderson. Carmarian, yeah. She provides a wealth of resources. Queen of the South. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to our office. So yeah. So we we really do um leverage our opportunities to serve. Thank you, Michael. Well, normally, like Lynn would say, during homecoming, um, testing as well and talking about sexual health. Uh, on HBCUs, I, I, you know, being on HBCU campus, Fried Chicken Wednesday is a big, it's a big event. So typically we try to schedule HIV testing on that day because it's, it well, pre-COVID again, it's a big, who's who, who's wearing what. So in order to get to the big cafeteria, you normally have to pass by where uh, we're doing our testing. So typically the testing numbers are up and I don't know what the testing numbers was looking like on Fish Fire Friday, this past Friday, but I have to get those numbers. It's nothing like being on an HBCU campus for those oh, days. Oh, I miss it. Oh, <laughs> That's true. It's nothing like so, the culture. <laughs> right. So during those time periods, we do do little giveaways. So like Lynn would say, it could be shirts that we have from left over from giving out um, during homecoming or special shirts that we have ordered for homecoming or for our freshman week that upperclassmen will just want to have some SSU paraphernalia. And you know what? We also do something for um, right before spring break. It's called Know Before You Go. And so we talk about yeah. sexual health and provide yeah. testing. I like that. Yeah. Know yeah. before you go. Write that down. Right. Taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. See, this is why we're doing this, so we can share ideas um, and hopefully know before you go. Um, <laughs> uh, before, so before before I uh, close and ask for any final thought, um, I did want to uh, you uh, ask about the the importance of leadership on campus and. Um, I know many, many on many campuses, uh, you know, we have to manage up a lot of times. And, you know, our university leadership presidents and et cetera have a lot of competing priorities. But uh, I just, you know, want to hear your thoughts around the importance of university leadership leaning in um, to this conversation about 
uh, HIV uh, prevention and awareness. And so, um, you know, that's not a trick question. I just, I really want folks to understand that um, sometimes, you know, I hear a lot of times like, oh, well, President so-and-so, he's really not in, into that. So we're not, you know, doing that. Um, but that's not good enough, right? And so um, I just want to hear from two, you know, folks that are uh, working um, at HBCU campuses, how, how important, uh, you know, leadership buy-in is. Well, for us at Alabama, well, for us at Alabama State All University, right, that was my phone. <laughs> <laughs> leadership buy-in is very important. Um, I had the pleasure of working for one of the best vice presidents of student affairs um, at an HBCU, Dr. Davida L. Haywood. She was our former vice president at Alabama State University, but she's now at one of HRC's partner schools for uh, the HRC HBCU Leadership Summit, Johnson C. Smith. Uh -huh. And one thing that oh she's at John she's at John, she's at Johnson C Smith now yes wow, okay so one of the things that we thought was very important was to develop not just our our staff on the administrative side and educate the campus on um, the college campus but also to make sure that we develop our student leaders that identified so that they can go out and help the community because we had a large uh, population of trans students. So we felt like, you know, sending those student leaders who were influential to the HRC HBCU summit was important. And so at her being a VP, she's able to move that up the chain of command to the president. And when they see the type of leadership that those students are developing, that they're receiving at those types of uh, programming, then they automatically buy in because it brings visibility to the institution, but it also helps with our student success. It helps with our retention rate and also helps with the rates of STIs and, and HIV on our campuses. So it's very important. Thank you for that. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> so I have the pleasure of working for one of the best dean of students, Benita Bradley. <laughs> dean <laughs> She's Bradley. Able, yeah, yeah, Dean Bradley. She's able to move things up the chain quickly. Um, so it is, it's very, very important to have upper administration buy-in they're able to shift things around when when you just feel like there's no no other way. You can't see no way. You're just getting hit in that brick wall. They're able to move those brick walls out the way and move things up the wall and um, out of the way. So like Linwood said, uh, Dr. Walton, F. Carl Walton, um, <laughs> he introduced me to Leslie and the HRC HBCU Leadership Summit. Um, and once we started sending students there, students were starting to make change on this institute, on this um, campus. And it was very important that when they started to let the upper administration presidents know that things just started moving real quickly. So it's very important to have upper administration buy in and, and students are able to see things that are happening on the campus when when that buy in of the presidents, they have the buy in of the president. So it's very important. Very, very important. Yes, yes, and I'll conclude. Um, thank you both for for that plug. It, it, you know, we we try very hard with the with the leadership summit, and I'm glad so many folks uh, get so much out of it. Um, we have a uh, just for our audience. We have um, every year. We weren't able to do it last year for obvious reasons, dealing dealing with COVID. But for the last two two years, um, 2018 and 2019, we were able to convene a group of HBCU presidents. Um, and we had uh, the uh, doc, doc from uh, Savannah State uh, come uh, and, and bless us. And, and I'm familiar with uh, the VP that you mentioned, um, Dr. Dr. Witten, uh, at, 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 from Alabama State. But now she's at Johnson C. Smith, which is so cool. I know a couple of people at Johnson C. Smith. I won't do my name dropping now. Um, so, so, so it's important that that we have leaders uh, buy into this idea that it is important. Not only is it good practice, this is morally right, <laughs> uh, right. considering the way um, the HIV is, uh, you know, ravaging through our, through our community, particularly uh, in the American South. So thank you for that. Uh, any last final words, final thoughts before we, before we say, say goodbye? Um, I just want to say, you know, please make sure that you support the HRC and the initiatives that they have, especially the HBCU Leadership Summit. Uh, if you have not been sending students to this uh, particular program, please send your student leaders uh, to this program. It is transformational. Uh, it also will help.
help out your college campus as well as affect the 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 experience that students will have on your campuses as well. So yeah, support. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Again, like <laughs> to be back off what Dr. Wynn said, please support the HRC HBC Leadership Summit. Uh, your students will go and learn valuable information, be able to come back and make change on your campuses, a change that you would never have thought about. Mm -hmm. um, they, they garner information from other institutions and even from uh, the advisors there. Uh, they get, are able to gain valuable information. So please, if you have not been sending students or if you sent students before but skipped out on a year, please continue to send students every year so that they can come back and make change on your campuses. And I wanna thank you two for uh, taking a moment out of your day uh, to help me with this. This is so important. I know both of you personally, you all are just two really committed uh, professionals on these campuses, Alabama State and Savannah State are lucky to have y'all. Um, y'all are really doing the Lord's work, I, and I mean that. Because, uh, you know, it's easy for us to sit back in these nice, comfy places and do this work, but y'all are really on the ground. And so I want to thank you uh, for your support of me and the program that I lead here at HRC, but also thank you for supporting your students. Um, you can tell how, how good a person is or staff person is by how their students talk about them. And y'all students love y'all, like they love y'all. And so uh, I wanna thank you, thank you for that. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, this conversation around HIV and STIs is a, is a critical one. I know uh, COVID-19 has kind of taken precedent in all of our lives right now, but it is important for us not to lose sight of some of the other long-standing challenges that are impacting our community uh, and in that impact in the HBCU, uh, HBCUs uh, across the country. And so with that, I am Leslie Hall. I'm the director of HBCU program, and I want to thank you all for joining us. And uh, what's, the, what's the thing that I learned today? Know before you go. So with that, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.